trust you can hear me. Uh, my name is Professor Christine McCartney, and I'm delighted to join you this evening. I'm the director of the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance, and we're delighted that uh, together um, with New South Wales Health, we're able to co-host this webinar on COVID-19 vaccination for pharmacist immunisers. So I'd uh, like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are meeting today. Um, we acknowledge Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities and pay respects to elders past and present and acknowledge uh, the First Peoples of Australia as the traditional custodians of the land and water on which we live, work and play. Um, at NCs and I know at New South Wales Health, we value the principles of self-determination, empowerment, working towards equal participation and equitable inclusion and voice. So just some housekeeping first, uh, a link to the recording of this webinar will be emailed to all attendees in the coming days. Uh, we've got a great um, panel of speakers and uh, together with um, some of our other uh, team members, we will be um, answering select questions live at the end of the webinar. You can submit your questions through the Q&A tab in the Zoom controls. Um, our staff uh, from both the Immunisation Unit at Health Protection New South Wales and from NCS will be typing answers to your questions um, throughout the webinar. And I'll put a little plug in for um, some of our staff at, uh, at NCS who are um, uh, pharmacists and academic um, evidence-based medicine specialists in the area of vaccines. So um, if you'd like to see one of the questions um, answered or it's similar to your question, you can upvote the question by clicking the thumbs up beside it. So today we're delighted to be joined by um, Judith Macton, New South Wales Chief Pharmacist, by Associate Professor Nick Wood, an Associate Director of Clinical Research and Services at NCS, and by Dr Penny Burns, who's a Disaster Medicine Specialist and General Practitioner. So uh, firstly, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Judith uh, Maxson to um, discuss the New South Wales vaccination standards. As New South Wales Chief Pharmacist, Judith manages regulation of medicines and poisons through the administration of the poisons and therapeutic goods legislation and provides technical and policy advice to the health system. Uh, Judith holds qualifications in pharmacy and pharmacoepidemiology and her professional interests encompass evidence-based health policy and medicine regulation and quality use of medicines, drug utilisation, health outcomes research and clinical guideline implementation. So um, Judith, we're delighted uh, to hear from you this evening. Thank you, Christine, and good evening, everyone. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with uh, the current situation with the uh, advice from the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, which you will be um, familiar with as pharmacist immunisers in New South Wales. So that advice on the 24th of July was that people aged 18 years and older in Greater Sydney should strongly consider being um, vaccinated with any vaccine, including the COVID-19 um, vaccine AstraZeneca, that the second dose of AstraZeneca vaccine could be brought forward, which you might like to discuss a little bit more later in the uh, panel session, um, that at that time, the Cominati Pfizer vaccine is still, was still, is probably still is the preferred vaccine for people aged under 60s in non-outbreak areas and is the vaccine to use in um, pregnant women at any stage of pregnancy. So these uh, pregnant women should be referred to their GP. Um, and everyone who's had one dose of the COVID-19 AstraZeneca vaccine should be offered a second dose of the vaccine. Next slide. So you were very familiar with the um, vaccination standards. So you must comply with the standards because they are actually um, an obligation under your uh, authority to be a pharmacist immuniser and supply the vaccine under the Poisons and Therapeutic Goods Regulation. Uh, so that means they're not a guideline. Um, you can administer the vaccine to people age 18 years and older who have given informed consent where you've discussed with them the benefits and um, potential harms of the vaccine. And you must at all times be consistent with the ATAGI advice, the product information and um, other general issues about immunisation in the Australian Immunisation Handbook. 
And because of the complexity with these provisionally registered vaccines, um, the standards do not permit a pharmacist immuniser to administer a vaccine to a person who has a contraindication or precaution. They should be referred to their GPs to be uh, medically assessed and the more complex issues considered. And also we're not permitting an intern pharmacist to, um, to be a pharmacist immuniser with respect to the AstraZeneca vaccine because of the complexity of the um, discussing the benefits and harms and the informed consent. Next slide, thank you. So the people who can receive AstraZeneca vaccine that may in fact be common problems, but will be common questions, but will be people that you will need to refer to the GP is people who do have a history of clots in typical sites. So DVTs and pulmonary embolism, um, people with non-immune thrombophilic disorders, people with a family history of clots or clotting conditions, people who are currently receiving anticoagulant medications. And there's probably a lot of your patients who who are, and people with a current or past throm uh, um, history of thrombocytopenia. Um, and of course, those people who've had any serious adverse events to the first dose um, need to be uh, considered as people with precautions as well. Thank you. So people should not receive the AstraZeneca AstraZeneca vaccine if they're pregnant at any stage, had a, a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, had heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, had splenic vein thrombosis or Bud's Chiari syndrome, had, a had antiphospholipid syndrome with thrombosis, thrombosis. People have had anaphylaxis previously to the vaccine or an ingredient. Uh, people who've had thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome after the first dose or any other serious adverse effects attributed to the first dose. Next slide. So one of the factors that's critical about um, the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine is people need to be advised of the risk of um, TTS and um, when to look for it in the four to 13 days following vaccination and when to seek medical advice. So whilst it's rare and actually fairly well quantified for a rare adverse reaction, um, it is new. It usually involves thrombosis, thrombocytopenia and a high D dimer. And it's really important that the patient understands to seek medical review if they have um, new severe or persistent headache, stomach or abdominal pain, chest pain, vomiting or visual symptoms, leg swelling or pain without, with or without associated colour change, chest pain or shortness of breath and bruising or particular hemorrhages. So it's a critical piece of information for your patients. Next slide. Um, it's important that you stay up to date with what the latest uh, uh, advice is. Um, New South Wales Health has information for clinicians on our web pages um, and new information, particularly around the safety, uh, keeps becoming available. So it's not a, it's not a static situation. Um, there is uh, the possibility to get expert advice from NCIRS through their uh, specialist service um, and some contact details are provided there. But of course, in many of these instances, you would have already referred a patient back to the GP. Next slide. So um, as a Schedule 4 medicine, in all cases, uh, people need to have information about benefits and harms before they, they agree to a treatment plan with a um, prescribing practitioner. It's the same process here. We're very clear that that has to be a very informed agreement to the treatment plan and informed consent process. Um, we need to make sure that it's documented. So you can either use, um, use the consent form that the Commonwealth Government's provided, either have the patient um, sign it and retain it, or you can make a record that in fact that, that process was um, applied. You need to be able to produce that record um, if required. Um, you do need to provide the patient with the specific patient information sheet. So, and that then includes those TTS syndromes to, uh, symptoms to watch out for. As an informed consent process, you do need to make sure the patient understands the information sheet and is able to 
ask questions and then use your professional um, expertise to work out whether or not fact a person is able to um, consent given any language or communication barriers. And if people have further questions or concerns that are outside your um, scope, refer them back to a medical practitioner, particularly their GP. Um, and we've, we've not permitted pharmacists to um, administer the vaccine to people who can't consent on their own behalf, simply because it's a more complex clinical um, scenario to, to work through. Next slide. You're very aware with the um, considerations in terms of the environment. So the standard requirements under the standards for where you can give uh, vaccination apply. Um, in one of the pre-submission uh, pre questions, there was a question about home visits. Uh, they're not, in, not included in, in the standards. And one of the reasons for that is that you need to have someone available to assist you in the a case, in the extremely rare event of um, an anaphylactic reaction, which you would not have if you were in a, um, in a home visiting situation. Uh, so, so as we said, those normal uh, requirements for the facilities apply. Next slide. So the post-vaccination care is um, really important in this case because these are new and provisionally registered um, medicines. So the person does need to remain on your premises for 15 minutes. Um, you will need to record if someone declines to follow that advice and leaves. Uh, people do need to have that um, information about what to expect as normal adverse reactions and what to monitor for in terms of um, serious adverse reactions and how to seek care immediately if there are symptoms of um, TTS. Next slide. Uh, the dosage information is obviously very available to you. And those of you who are already vaccina vac vaccinating are very well aware of the uh, drawing up techniques with the multi-dose vial and the um, 0.5 mil dose. Next slide, thanks. So if given that um, for almost all of us, multi-dose vials are not something that we're familiar with, um, that's one of the reasons why that training is required by the Commonwealth Department of Health to make sure that you're familiar with it. You need to think very carefully about your um, aseptic technique to make sure that it's um, safe. You need to think very carefully about where contamination risk might, or might exist. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you don't pool excess um, volume from any from multiple vials because you're creating additional manipulation that, that can create risk of contamination. Um, the other question that I've had in this space is around if you have another pharmacist who's drawing up for you, how do you, you know, do you need to label them? Well, the normal rules about user applied labeling would apply. So if that's if that um, drawn up syringe doesn't remain within your site, well yes, it would need to have user applied labeling. Um, applied and you should use those doses as soon as possible to um, minimise potential risk of contamination when that's over and above the, um, the issue of stability once, um, once removed from the fridge. Um, so make sure you only withdraw product from the refrigerator that you need for the uh, immediate session working with patients and only have the materials that you need um, in, in your workspace um, and I'll leave the rest of that for you to read. Thank you, next slide. Um, in our vaccination hubs in New South Wales Health, in the early days when now um, immunizers were first working in this space, the, um, we were finding there was a little bit of an issue with um, coring. So this is the um, standard advice about techniques to avoid coring um, with um, synthetic rubber bungs. So it's important that you um, access that information and uh, think about it. It, it also, having that good technique with respect to puncturing the vial also usually deals with that sense of, well, have I got any residual bung material on the, um, uh, on the needle? And of course, you need to have um, techniques that avoid needle sticks, uh, stick injury. Um, and I think we'll go on to the next one. Thanks, next slide. So the um, New South Wales Health is currently working with the Clinical Excellence Commission to do a tailored community pharmacy specific reference guide on PPE and community pharmacy. Their key points though are that hand hygiene, physical distancing and screening all patients for symptoms and contact with a case and regular environmental cleaning are just as important 
as appropriate use of PPE to prevent transmission. So you, your risk assessment will determine the level of PPE that you require. So that, and you need to continue um, screening patients, keeping that distance other than when obviously vaccinating and that environmental cleaning. People using PPE do need to um, understand and follow procedures for donning and doffing. Um, and, and certainly New South Wales Health has online training for that. Next slide, thanks. Um, vaccine supply. So as you know, normally pharmacists may, may not on supply a Schedule 4 medicine to another pharmacist, but a special licence has been issued to allow on supply of the um, AstraZeneca vaccine uh, between pharmacies, between New South Wales Health uh, Vaccination Hub and your pharmacy if necessary, and, and between a um, Commonwealth approved community pharmacy and a Commonwealth approved um, general practice. Uh, there are record keeping requirements. So if you're asked to do that, um, have a look at the website on the conditions of the licence. Thanks, next slide. Aboriginal people, um, there is a significant gap in the vaccination rate between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. So we do need to improve the vaccination rollout, particularly in regional New South Wales. Um, uh, Aboriginal people who are aged 12 years and older are eligible, but of course your vaccination standards um, still limit uh, limit the age that you can um, vaccinate Aboriginal people. Um, there's a wide range of resources that's been prepared on the New South Wales Health website, Centre for Aboriginal Health, that you can use to um, promote and encourage uptake in, uh, in your pharmacies. Thanks, next slide. Similarly, for people um, using other languages, so there's a vast amount of material in other languages on the New South Wales Health website for COVID-19 generally, but also specifically information on COVID-19 um, vaccination. So um, please access that if that's relevant for your particular community. Thanks, next slide. And thanks, thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you. Back to you, Christine. Um, I'm going to have questions in the panel at the end, I think. Yeah, that's right. That was um, an excellent overview, Judith. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, to make sure we have plenty of questions at the end, I'm going to move now to um, introduce, uh, I was almost going to go out of order there, but I think I'm introducing you next. No, I'm not introducing you next, Penny. I'm introducing Nick next. Yep, there we go. Sorry. Uh, uh, so Nick uh, is possibly not well known to you. He's, uh, he's certainly not well known to us. He's an associate professor at um, the University of Sydney. He's a senior um, paediatrician and also uh, director of our clinical research and clinical um, trials area at, um, at NCIS. He leads the New South Wales Immunisation Specialist Service and he coordinates some um, uh, you know, a, a vaccine safety um, work at NCS as well. So he's going to take us fairly quickly through um, some of the elements, um, particularly focusing on the AstraZeneca vaccine. Thanks very much, Nick. Thanks, Christine. And hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, this will be rapid. And I did see a, a uh, note in there about can we have the slides? And, and I think the answer to that would, will be yes. So um, what we'd like to do is just quickly run you through a bit more of the sort of meat and bones about the risk benefit discussion um, and concentrate a little bit on the TTS, which is the clotting story. Um, so as you know, now we are obviously New South Wales is in an outbreak. Um, so anyone 60 years of older and unvaccinated needs to get that vaccine as soon as they can. Um, if they have had dose uh, one already, then we've talked, uh, Judith mentioned before, trying to move dose two a little bit earlier, uh, down to that four to eight week mark. And anyone under the age of 60 for which, as you have heard, Pfizer is the preferred vaccine, but if they want AstraZeneca, to more supply, then they need to have a chat with the healthcare provider about the risks and likely benefits. Um, so how do you do that and what do you say to them? Uh, I think the important things from my view are to talk a little bit about the risk of infection, which I'll say something in a minute, explain the efficacy of the vaccine, that even one dose will give you some good protection and then have uh, then talk about the safety of the vaccines and encourage you to have a look at the Ausvac safety website uh, there's the link there on it are some fantastic graphs and figures that you can show to your patients explain the common side effects after dose one and dose two of AstraZeneca. 
Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the TTS risk in a second. And, and Judith has mentioned the symptoms that might be related and what you should do if you get such a symptoms. In terms of infectivity, uh, Delta is now felt to be as infectious as chickenpox. You probably heard the media talk about or in other scientific publications about the R0. Um, it's, it's up there, um, somewhere around the five mark, um, and, and it is obviously more um, severe than chicken pox. So that's the sort of base, base um, infectivity that we think Delta is running at now. Um, in terms of um, effectiveness, uh, AstraZeneca, which is the top box there, you can see that the thing we really want to protect against is hospitalization and death. And so if someone says, look at doc or, uh, you know, pharmacist, how effective is the um, AstraZeneca? Two doses, upwards of 90% against hospitalization or dying. And as you've shown, he only, only a single dose is, is pretty good as well. So importantly, to try and get one dose in. Uh, and that will hopefully stop people ending up in hospital or dying. The vaccine will take two to three weeks, two to three weeks before it has some sort of um, effectiveness. Um, in terms of the risk of the TTS, which is the thrombosis thrombocytopenia syndrome, this is the estimated rates by age. Um, and you can see here that it is slightly higher in the under 50s compared to the over 50s. Important to note though, that we have given less vaccine in that under 50s, but so the rate is not as robust as the older age group, but that's the ballpark sort of rate of about one in, in 30,000 um, getting the TTS. Um, Judith mentioned these uh, symptoms which are in this middle box here. Um, I, I, I just wanted to add that um, people may complain of a headache in the first 24 to 48 hours. And that's a very common side effect of AstraZeneca dose one. That headache should go away. If it continues, it's persistent, then that is a, is a potential sign that they need to be uh, looked at further. Um, GPs and emergency departments around the country are now very well versed with thinking about this clotting syndrome and so, um, you will end, people that do get referred will end up with some screening blood tests to try and understand if they have thrombosis and or thrombocytopenia. Um, what we also know is that if we treat this, recognise this early uh, and, and diagnose it, that we treat it early, we get good outcomes. So the haematologists have had success in reversing these uh, nasty clots um, if recognising early. So. Um, Although it says severe or persistent headache, I wouldn't put people off being encouraged to report any headache. And if it, if it is a headache, it's not a usual headache for them. Um, and it, it's, it's lasting a bit longer than say the first 24, 48 hours. Make sure you go and get, get checked out. Um, the other thing to say is that people might ask about the ITP and there is a small risk of ITP as shown in the Scottish study there, which was published in Nature Medicine, ITP being the low platelet count. Uh, these people may present with some petechiae or bruising. Um, and, and there's also a, a note here about um, the, the fact that there have been some reports to the TGA of ITP. There's a link here in the red from the TGA. Every week, the TGA updates the safety report on a Thursday. So I encourage you to have a look at that weekly safety report every Thursday uh, when the TGA up updates it. Uh, there is a, a potential um, interest in looking at GBS cases as well. And it's not a confirmed link, but just to mention that um, it is being looked at as is this other rarer syndrome called capillary leak syndrome. Um, at the moment, Australia is not routinely recommending mixed schedules. So we're not routinely saying get Astra dose one and Pfizer dose two, okay? Um, the current advice is if you stick to the same brand, unless you have a special circumstances and Atagi has just, uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, released some advice on what those special circumstances are and whether to switch. Um, uh, these mentioned before, but I think and I won't go through them in detail, but if someone does have any of these side effects after dose one, then they need to have a discussion about moving to either a different vaccine or further assessment, okay? Um, importantly, um, if someone has had dose one of AstraZeneca, 
uh, and has the following um, issues here in these four bullet points. Um, even if they had no problems after dose one, uh, there is a recommendation to change them to dose two. Okay, so there have been some people, not many, who were inadvertently had, say, for example, a splanchnic vein thrombus, like a portal vein thrombus, who had dose one and didn't have any problems, um, but the move, recommendation was to move them now to a dose two of Pfizer. I won't go through these in detail. These algorithms are available in this particular document here, and they are being updated. Uh, but hopefully you'll, you'll find them useful in practice. So we won't I just, these are just really slides to make you aware that they, they do, um, there is some documentation there in that about these algorithms. So, so have a look at those. Um, and the last couple of bits from me really are that the safety of the mixed schedule is, is possibly a little bit more reactogenic when you have um, AstraZeneca dose one and Pfizer dose two. Um, there is more data emerging on this particular combination and the safety profile, um, but um, th that's what we know. And that also is included in that ATAGI document. OSVAC safety is monitoring the uh, mixed schedules and we'll be reporting on the particular uh, findings that we see in, in the community when we get en enough data. Um, so in, in order to get as many questions as we can answer, this was just a very rapid tour uh, through some of the AstraZeneca specific things. Encourage people to get dose one. Um, dose one will give you some pretty good protection against hospitalization. Dose two is very good protection against hospitalization and death. The safety is being monitored and will, may well need to be updated. So have a look at the TGA weekly reports uh, that there are this rare clotting disorder that people need to be made aware of and what to do if they have the symptoms and encourage you to report any side effects that uh, it, it may come your way in the pharmacy. Uh, this is the, a lot of information here. Um, we've, we've gone through it very quickly, but I'll, I'll stop there, Christine, so we can have some questions. I oh, thank uh, Nick. And on your last slide, it was in the bottom right-hand corner, but we do have a very exciting web webinar coming up at the end of the month with information that'll, that sh should be up on our website now, um, which we'll be talking about there it is, um, our next, what, what next for Australia's vaccine program. So it's a little advertorial that we'll be talking about Moderna, which is anticipated to be um, in Australia in, in September, and uh, indeed some of the model predictions about where we're going with the pandemic. So, but um, thank you, Nick, for an excellent talk. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our final speaker for today, Dr. Penny Burns. Uh, Penny is a GP currently working at the Northern Beaches Hospital Medical Centre, um, delivering AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines, working at the DY General Practice Respiratory Clinic and, and uh, the Westmead Pfizer Vaccination Hub. Um, she's also recently been um, appointed as a member of ATAGI. She's a member of the National COVID-19 Evidence Task Force, the RACGP COVID Working Group, COVID Health Pathways, um, and is a specialist in disaster medicine and pandemics, which she's been conducting research on for some period of time, has affiliations with ANU and the University of Western Sydney. So, um, Penny, pleasure to hear from you. And I think you're going to particularly talk to us about um, this informed consent process. Thanks very much, Christine. So I'll just share my screen with you. So thank you very much for inviting me to come. Look, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today and pay my respects to all their um, elders, uh, past, present and future. Um, and I think, um, I think the important thing about today is that um, it's, it's really exciting that we're having more and more people coming on board, having the pharmacists come on board and we're all starting to um, rapidly see an increase in the number of vaccines that are being shown. So today I'm going to be talking really, um, I've been asked to run through a fairly practical session, but I'm going to go through the process of informed consent, um, particularly from a GP perspective, but I think it's the same for everyone. Um, eligibility and medical assessment. So there's a little bit of overlap with what Nick um, has said. Um, conversations with patients on the benefits and risks of AstraZeneca, but given that we're in, a, in an outbreak now, that's actually changed a little bit. Um, and then just to touch on what we're seeing in terms of post-vaccination observation and care um, and adverse events that people need to know about to, to come back to, um, if they need to go and see their GP. So 
Look, Australia's got a population of 20 million and of over 15 years of age. And at the moment, if you have a look here on the left, 48% of people have had at least one dose and 25% of people have had two doses. And that is rapidly increasing as we're in continuing to roll it out. I know that the Kudos Stadium um, at Homebush is just really ramping up. Um, and uh, you know, at Westmead, we're delivering 1,300 vaccinations a day. And I think at Kudos, they're talking about doing 30,000. So this is a huge amount of vaccinations that are gonna be increasing and rolling out soon. And here on the right, more importantly, we've got um, the pharmacists have come on board and we've not now got, we've probably got more than two and a half thousand pharmacies now coming on board um, and they've delivered um, almost 100,000 doses already. And you can just see the little orange tip at the end here where the pharmacists are starting to contribute. So look, I know that you probably all saw this this morning with the, um, with the Premier and Dr Champ, but I just wanted to go over the fact that we really are in a situation at the moment where we need to get out and get vaccinated. So in the last 24 hours, we've had 633 new cases. We've got 462 hospital admissions. We've got 72, 70, 77 people in ICU. We've got 25 on ventilations, and unfortunately we've had three fatalities. Um, and I'd like to um, offer my condolences to people who have lost their loved ones and people who are um, currently battling with COVID. It's, a, it's not a nice disease. Um, the other thing to think about at the moment is the fact that um, the stats to the 31st of July, so this is the last six weeks, I don't have the latest ones, um, but if you look at the top, the box on the top left, you'll see the um, hospitalisation IC admissions um, by vaccination status. So you can see up the top there, there's um, of those that are hospitalised, only 1.7% are fully vaccinated. And of those that, um, that have no vaccination, that's 88%. And of those that are hospitalised in an ICU, um, none of those are fully vaccinated um, and 91% um, have no vaccination. So you can see an effect there from vaccination. And then in terms of how many people are in hospital as a result of COVID-19, we've got pretty much um, all ages represented there. Um, and particularly if you look here in this column here, um, 30 to 49 year olds, 50 to 59 year olds are the bulk of people that are currently hospitalized. Um, and we're still though seeing the elderly, the over 80 is those with the greatest rate of hospitalization. And then I find this graph actually really useful um, to show the patients. Um, it's not directly about who's vaccinated and who's not vaccinated. But what it is, is it shows the second and third wave in the UK and it's out of one of the newspapers there. Basically, the second wave, on the left, you've got the cases per 100,000 population and on the right, you've got the deaths per, per 10 million um, population. And that's based on their second wave, which was in September last year. And then the third wave, which was in May this year, where a lot of population were actually already vaccinated, um, you can see the difference there. So with the same number of cases per 100,000 population, but down to 2.1 per 10 million population from 36. So it's quite a dramatic drop. So I've been asked to talk to you about the practical aspects of informed consent. And so I thought the easiest way to do that was actually sort of take you through a bit of a scenario. So I'm going to talk to you as we would sort of deliver it at our AstraZeneca clinic. So basically a lot of the action happens before the patients arrive. So and those of you who've already set up clinics, you will know all about this. So it's all about systems, about patient flow, about logistics, and it will vary depending on um, how much space you have and how many people you're taking through at any one time. Um, but what you want to establish is, is best practice really in terms of infection, infection control, um, in terms of getting patients through and keeping them safe while they're being vaccinated and after they're being vaccinated, um, and then getting them out as quickly as possible. So it's really, one of the ways I've, we've done it is we've actually walked through as a patient. So we've gone through and walked through our practice. We've sat in the places the patients will sit and wait. Um, and then we've gone through and we've sat where they'll, where they'll leave um, and looked at how our infection control process is going and what documents we need. So it's, it's about setting up some of those things that Nick's already mentioned, um, having posters and signage so it's really easy for patients to see. Um, out in, in our place, they, they turn up at the desk first. Um, and then they're directed to an area where they sit and wait and do their consent forms. Um, and then they go into an area where the GP talks to them and then they go and get vaccinated and then they go to another waiting room. It sounds like we've got a really big area. We don't, we've just got it very well um, signposted and we're very tightly uh, directed. So taking bookings in advance has really helped us with our software. Um, 
we were able to um, then have all the patients' details before they arrived. So minimizing the amount of time that they're spending when they come into the practice. Um, providing them with those consent forms in advance if you can is really useful because then they can go through and look at that and they're not spending time in the practice. Um, occasionally we have people come in who can actually take quite a long time to go through reading the free information and the patient consent form before they come to get vaccinated. And then we've got the autofills and templates. Um, the patients move through fairly quickly. Um, and so, you know, to type up notes for every patient is really difficult. And it also prompts you to make sure that you've checked all those questions. So this is just an example of an autofill we have in our software for, for the first dose of AstraZeneca. Um, and it goes through those questions to make sure that we've done it. We change them as we need to. Um, and then it just, with a little checklist here of things that we need to make sure that we've done. And then also the equipment, um, that all needs to be obviously set out and organized and have a system for how you're gonna do that, where you're gonna draw it up, where you're going to administer it and what you need. Um, and having um, the uh, adrenaline ready to go and um, the blood pressure machine and those sorts of equipment that you might need in, in terms of having side effects. So they're all set up well and truly beforehand and then taking patient bookings um, is done beforehand. And I'm just gonna mention here, and I know you've already had it mentioned before, but this is really is the crux of it. So in some places, um, so like in Westmead, for example, when I was working there, at one stage, um, we were ringing patients before they came in to check their eligibility and make sure that there weren't any um, issues around any of these um, precautions or contraindications. Um, in the clinic I work with, um, in the medical center, we don't have the capacity to do that. We don't have the staff. So we do a quick check when they come in and just the, the reception staff that just actually say any severe allergies or anaphylaxis. If they do, um, respond yes to that. In, in our practice, we're giving them a, a red card um, and that flags it for the, the doctor that's taking through to say that they may need to wait a little bit longer. And we're also giving them that information sheet um, as soon as they come in and also um, the consent forms. So on arrival, they come in, they're screened at the beginning before they come in and before they can enter. Um, and then they're directed to certain seats and these are spaced apart. Um, and they're given the information that they need, the, the information on the COVID vaccine and the consent form, their details are recorded. Um, and then they, we, we actually group them in our practice. So we, we have a group of 10 going through at one time and that just makes it easier for us in terms of giving informed consent. So this is the eligibility checklist. checklist. It's really um, useful and it's in that consent, um, consent package that you get. And this I think is one of the, the most useful things that you've got. So I realise that there's slightly different things with um, pharmacists in terms of not being able to do the proportions, but there's also a few things in here where I know you'll be, you're able to do that, but you'll have questions and queries from the patients. So the first, the ones below are the ones that Nick's already alluded, and Jude's already alluded to, and they're the, they're the ones that um, you won't be administering. So, you know, have you had pillory leak syndrome? That's an absolute contraindication. Have you had TTS with a previous dose of COVID-19 vaccine? No, that's a contraindication. And then these first four up the top here, allergic reaction to a previous dose of COVID-19 vaccine, anaphylaxis to another vaccine or medication. And it's useful to know that um, in the Australian Immunisation Handbook, they've actually got a list of the um, medications that contain polysorbate 8, and that's, that's very useful. So like flu quad, for example, and boosters both contain um, polysorbate. So they've actually had that vaccination and had a reaction to that. Then it, the, and had that safely, then they're, they're less likely to have any issues with this um, vaccine. And then um, mastocytosis, which is called we call um, recurrent anaphylaxis. Again, there's the anaphylaxis, so you don't have to worry so much about um, that. That's a contraindication. Um, and then the ones that actually probably cause the most conversation for us are actually, have you had uh, at least this here below there? So bleeding disorders and blood thinners. Blood thinners are huge. I think we get um, probably a third of our patients are on blood thinners coming through. And you can tell that we're vaccinating a lot of older people. Um, and so that's often the only thing. And with the, with the um, blood thinners, if you're on warfarin, for example, and your INR is pretty stable and it's below three, then there's no issues to um, having that. It's the same with any other vaccination. We just say you need to, you might, the risk is we get a bit more bleeding, a bit of a hematoma. So we want you to just pop your hand over the vaccination site for a couple of minutes longer just to stop that risk. Um, similar with having a bleeding disorder. Again, you need to know how stable um, the, the bleeding is um, and you can assess that at the time. Do you have a weakened immune system? The reason for that is that you need to have a discussion with them about the fact that they may get less um, immune protection from that. 
and that if they're actually having a course of immunosuppression, then and they can they can vary when that time is. It's better to have the vaccine first and then wait two weeks so that they've got the chance to build up that immunity from that first vaccine and then have that course of um, immunotherapy. So that again, that's a conversation that's fairly easy to have. Are you pregnant? Again, very very uh, very easy to have. And initially, we were vaccinating pregnant women with um, some pregnant women with AstraZeneca. And that's changed over now. So we have had some women who had AstraZeneca for the first dose now get Pfizer for the second dose. Um, the evidence is stronger around protection from Pfizer. Um, and so that's the reason that Pfizer is preferred. And this is another one that comes up a little bit. Have you been sick with cough, sore throat, fever, or are you feeling sick in another way? This has um, been amazingly common. Um, so I've had a number of patients who say, oh, yes, I've got a cough. And then have you been swabbed? No, I haven't been swabbed. So that is a, 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 an infection control issue or, um, for the rest of the patients who are there, and that patient needs to be very quickly removed and asked to go and get swabbed or, um, and, and come back you know, later. So if, they're, if they've got any signs of something that could be COVID, you need to move them out fairly quickly. Um, and then have you had a COVID-19 vaccination before is fairly straightforward. And have you received any other vaccination in the last seven days? And the main reason for that is around the side effects and not wanting to produce those side effects. And most people now have got the message that um, it's important not to have together. And so with us, we, we have a 30 minute card or 15 minute card in most people's hands. And so if we've got the 30 minute card um, person, then we'll actually um, prioritize them first because we're gonna get them to wait longer. Um, in your situation, you may have every, only have people who are waiting 15 minutes. Um, and so that may not be an issue for you. So, so before vaccination, we need to obtain informed consent. And the way we're doing that is um, by having people grouped in the groups of 10 and we get them to come into another area now once they've all arrived, because people do, we are finding we have a booked afternoon of about three or four hours and we get people coming in for the last session and the first session. So it's, it, people are not, are not very good at coming in on time is what I found. Um, and so we're grouping 10 together and then we're moving into this other area where a GP actually talks to them and goes through um, what they need to do. Um, the patients, we make sure that they're screened, they have their masks on, we sit them, set, we separate them. If anybody's got a carer or someone who um, they wish to bring them with them, we try and separate that person out. Um, we, if there's a language issue or some other issue, then we would tend to allow that carer to come through with them. The staff are also wearing infection protection control. So we're wearing P2 masks at the moment and we're wearing eye eyewear. And then between patients, we're wiping down seats and, um, and, and making sure that everything's clean in between, so infection control. Um, so in terms of what we go through with the, with the patients, it's a sort of a really a rough little checklist that's also on um, the consent form. Um, and we go through a quick list of these and it actually only takes a few minutes um, I'm just going to take you through now what we would sort of say. So normally we'll come up, um, I'll normally stand near someone. If someone's got hard of hearing, I'll tend to stand near them first um, so that they can hear a little bit more easily because those masks can be quite hard to hear through. So I usually start off with just saying, hi, my name's Penny. Um, so, some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm a GP. I'm going to talk to you today about the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine you're about to receive. So fantastic for coming to get it. I'm going to answer any questions. Then our nurse immuniser, Sue or Peter, um, is going to see you in that room there. And she's going to check your eligibility with you one by one and make sure it's fine, yeah, okay to administer the vaccination. She'll give you the vaccine. And then you're going to go in down to this corridor and wait. And our receptionist, um, Leslie, will um, give you a record of the fact that you've been vaccinated, book you for a second vaccination between the current time recommended is four to eight weeks. And we're booking everyone at six weeks and then a sheet on what to look for after the vaccination so you know how to report um, any adverse reactions and what to do. And then basically I'll start then talking about the current situation. So at the moment I'd say we're currently in the middle of an outbreak of COVID-19 um, and a key way to protect ourselves, our family and our community is to get vaccinated. This current Delta virus has really lifted the, the game in this and it's more severe, especially in younger people and it's thought to be more easily spread. Um, we know that the risk of um, severe disease and fatality um, progresses as you get older. So those that are in the older age groups are at more risk of getting um, severe disease from COVID. And we also know that between 10 and 30% of people who get um, COVID-19 may end up with some ongoing illness in the months afterwards. So it's not a, not a good disease, COVID. And the best way to prevent it is to get vaccinated um, and to follow the public health measures. So the vaccine, 
doesn't stop you getting COVID. You can still get COVID. Um, it doesn't give you the live virus, but it decreases the risk of developing um, severe disease or death from COVID. If you get um, a cold or um, respiratory symptoms, you still need to um, go and get swabbed. You still need to wear masks. You still need to distance. Um, and you still need to get tested because you, um, you, you may have COVID. So the vaccine um, efficacy varies depending on from study to study, um, but it provides good protection. So early on, they were talking about 76% efficacy or protection from symptomatic disease um, after the first dose, which is 22 days um, after the first dose, up to 12 weeks, and then 81% um, after the second dose. For the Delta variant of concern, um, you're getting about 70 to 88% protection against hospitalisation after dose one and 92% after dose two. So the second dose prolongs that protection. It gives you that little bit of extra boost. It's really important to get both doses. The dose interval between the two, it's usually given between four and 12 weeks, as I mentioned, um, but and the preference has been previously when we had more luxury about um, not having such an outbreak was to 12 weeks to try and get that little bit of extra efficacy or protection. But now that we're in the middle of an outbreak, um, it's being moved earlier and the preference is to have it between four and eight weeks to give you that earlier full protection against COVID, which is an awful disease. Um, and then I might talk about in terms of eligibility, uh, the if you've got anaphylaxis to any components of the vaccine, you're not, it, we don't, you're not able to get it. That's an absolute contraindication. Um, and we'll, the nurse will talk to you about that when you go in. The things we want you to remember are um, the, there is a condition called thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, and you've probably all heard about that, and most people will and, and, and will acknowledge that. Um, at the moment, we, the rate is between one to three per hundred thousand. It's higher in those that are under 60, which is why the original cutoff was, was that age. Um, we There's nothing that we know of that um, is a pre-existing medical condition that makes you more likely to get that except for younger age. Um, those people that have clots of various types, there's no contra there's no um, suggest thought that they you will be more likely to get the, the TTS. The risk in the second vaccine um, is 10 times less the second dose. Um, and you're um, basically um, so so you can security. Um, and then we would also mention that we are tracking side effects um, and that we um, are reporting all the vaccines to the air. Um, and, um, and that one thing that we want them to remember, the serious thing we want to remember them, is that the side effects of TTS occur usually four to 42 days after the vaccination. And the things you're looking out for, and the way I do it is this, I do, so if you get a severe headache or um, may, maybe some blurring of vision, if you get severe chest pain or some shortness of breath, if you get severe abdominal pain or if you get severe limb pain or if you get um, little petechiae at the, at the site of the vaccination, then we want you to go straight in and see your GP and they'll do some blood tests um, to monitor that. And then I'll go through the lesser side effects which have already been done. Back to Sen, I can see you. Still okay? Maybe another one or two minutes, Penny, if, if you can, and just to allow time for questions at the end. Yeah, no worries. Um, and so that's really important. And then I guess what we do after that is we um, we essentially um, go through, they go in and they get vaccinated. Um, the nurse goes through that checklist, uh, goes through the checklist, makes sure that they're eligible, gives them the vaccination, and then they go and wait um, in the waiting area. In terms of side effects, the main thing, we're not seeing very many side effects from the AstraZeneca. We're seeing a lot more from the Pfizer. Um, and I must say, and, uh, and so we've had one case of uh, possible anaphylaxis, which uh, was sort of almost happened. Uh, and then the majority though have been fainting or vasovagals. And I think that's really important that you're aware of those. Thank you, I'm done, Christine. Oh, okay. Well, I certainly didn't want to rush you because that was absolutely fantastic, Penny. Thank you so much. And I can see, um, particularly on your, your slide there, um, it, the last thing was, of course, about, course, about reporting all vaccinations to the AIR, the Australian Immunisation Register. And I just wanted to, to emphasise because, um, in fact, our teams had the privilege of working closely with the pharmacy sector, um, particularly Lauren Dalton on, on um, you know, working about transmission to the air. So, of course, this is now mandated to report all COVID-19 influenza and NIP vaccines to the AIR. I know that um, Judith touched on this as well. 
And important to recognise that while some pharmacy software is integrated to report to air, others may need to use um, the clinical vaccine integrated platform, CVIP, or log into the air site. And vaccination history can be viewed on the air site or via a patient's My Health record. And I, I guess, you know, pharmacists coming online, which, which I would also um, just like to say how, how welcome, welcoming I am to see this and pleased to see this happening. Uh, it's just wonderful. But um, I think importantly, you know, if you have someone who walks in and says, oh, can I get my second dose with you? You know, you really want to get verification of the type and time and, and, and uh, of, of their first dose. Uh, so, you know, it's not just about checking, adding vaccines to the air. It's also about um, if you are vaccinating someone with a second dose, um, you know, perhaps different to their first dose provider, you're going to check, check that. So um, I'm going to now hand over to um, uh, Dr. Sonia Ennis, who is actually um, the manager of the New South Wales Immunisation um, Program at Health Protection New South Wales. And Sonia's going to be our um, moderator of, of questions this evening um, to the panel. And uh, welcome, Sonia. Thanks very much, Christine. And hi, everyone. What fantastic presentations we've had so far. Um, I'll start off with some questions we've ha we have received before the webinar started today that people sent through online. So thanks very much. We have had some questions around efficacy of AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines, which already have been covered. But someone has asked a um, question around, can we administer AstraZeneca vaccine to a patient with haemophilia in the pharmacy? Um, I'm not quite sure who would like to answer that question. Maybe Christine or Nick? Uh, well, I was, uh, Nick, Nick might want to add, but, um, you know, I think they're, they've got a, a very specialised clotting condition, haemophilia. They can receive the vaccine, but it's really about where they would be in respect of um, their risk of, of um, haematoma and bleeding at the injection site. Um, and that would relate to whether they've just had a factor in, in you know, injection infusion. So I would say that um, I'd really probably err on the side of having them managed by their, their, their GP or the, indeed their... Um, their specialist uh, who would know the best time to vaccinate them in relation to their um, in relation to their haemophilia. But Nick, did you did you want to add to that? No, no, I agree. I mean, you, sometimes we do the factor levels on them, and and it's probably a bit more a bit more complicated. And so, yeah, I think putting it back to the treating clinician might be an easier approach. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Christine. Um, Judith, I might refer to you now on the online chat. We've had a few questions around needles and 21 gauge and 25 gauge and how to minimise the dead space. Would you be able to respond to that question or those questions or give advice on where they can find the answers to those questions? Yeah, I think um, the I have to ask, answer it generally, which is that because the Commonwealth supplied um, stock of needles and syringes has been changing through the vaccination program, what we've been doing with um, our staff who were drawing up vaccines in our New South Wales health vaccination hubs has been working through the best technique, um, particularly around dead space issues, depending on which needle and syringe you've actually got and whether they're low dead space ones. So probably what the best thing we can do is as follow up is, is um, provide for you what we've, what we've given to our New South Wales Health Vaccination Clinic staff who are drawing up for the stock they currently have. Um, because the, and the Commonwealth's about to change the stock that's provide, provided to New South Wales Health. So we're about to change the um, instructions that we provide about the, the best way to go about it. So I think I'll just have to answer that one um, generally because unless we know which particular um, mm brand of product and whether it's low dead space or not it's a little bit hard to answer it. Thanks Judith and there is another question about where they should discard used vials someone said they have a huge clinical waste bin but there's no symbols about medications where they can be discarded. Yeah so medications are discarded in normal clinical waste bins. Thanks Judith. Just moving on topic slightly we have had some questions around um, Northern Sydney being in Sydney and Northern Sydney and what's the best time frame between doses and should we apply the whole of New South Wales to lockdown? Um, I think in general we should. We want, you've heard um, our Premier and our Chief Health Officer every day advising to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So I don't think we should be waiting um, if, you're not, if you're in an LGA where you don't have cases. That could change tomorrow. As we can see, we've had 633 cases today. 
Um, so if someone turns up to be vaccinated, absolutely, um, you are considered in an outbreak area. The whole of New South Wales now is in lockdown. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone disagrees with that, but that would be my advice. Okay, now just let me go back to the other questions. My sorry, I'm jumping between the screens here. Um, sorry, Judith, another quick question about the risk of infection, about the uh, introduction of the rubber bung when the same needle is used to drop and administer. Yeah, again, this one's a little complex because um, I'm not entirely familiar with what the Commonwealth training says. Um, so I think refer back to then, back to that, those instructions, follow them and be very, very vigilant about your um, aseptic technique. Sure. Um, question here about a person who's received the first dose from a different place and when they comes into the pharmacy for a second dose and we find out that they're immunocompromised or has, or has had some other medical condition or taken some medications that should flash a precaution, should we still offer him the second dose or should he provide a letter from a GP or specialist who approved him for the vaccination? Um, Nick or Christine? Um. It sort of depends on what it was um, in terms of the precaution. Uh, so it's hard to be absolutely specific, but, um, you know, if it lists, well, if it's one of those precautions that we've talked about on a couple of occasions tonight, then obviously no. Um, so it's hard to be absolutely precise, unless Christine's got some other thoughts. I think I think the same thing applies. And, and look, if you're, un, if you're unsure, I think it's just supporting that person, um, you know, to... to be able to to have a discussion with someone if if it's you know Penny might want to add but if you know if it's really sounding quite complicated and you've got un, you're unsure about their medical condition then I think it's you know it's over to the GP if if you're getting a clear history um, you've got a patient that you're confident you know they're confident they're giving you the information to make a decision then and there and you can go against that checklist uh, you know you're probably good to go but I think uncertainty you you definitely want to liaise um, with a GP or, or a medical specialist. And in a similar vein, someone said, if not all GPs are providing COVID vaccinations and that they refer their complex patients to a pharmacy, can we go ahead and vaccinate them? Penny, do yeah. you want to do that one? Um, look, I, I think you're the one vaccinating, so you're the one who has to be comfortable. Um, so I think, you know, obviously if the GPs refer, it might be worth a quick call to the, to the GP if you're not sure and don't know about it. Um, but I think it depends, again, on the complications. So, you know, and just back to that last one, you know, if they've got immunosuppression, a lot of people have got, you know, thyroid disease, um, uh, you know, some sort of mild immunosuppression that doesn't matter. It's those that are on the heavy-duty medications or the immunotherapies that we're careful about vaccinating. So I think a lot of those um, are not as complicated as they sound when they actually present. Um, but I think if you're unsure, I mean, if I'm unsure, what I would do is I would ring a GP. Um, the other thing is the NSWIS is really useful and really helpful. Um, so contacting the NSRS helpline, that's our go-to. Do be aware, though, that when you call them, they probably won't answer because they're overwhelmed, but they do call you back, even if it's later that evening. So you might have a time lag on that. Um, look, I think as a GP, I'd be really happy to hear from a pharmacist who says, hey, I'm not sure what to do about this. Um, so I think, you know, we all need to help each other doing this. Um, and I've had lots of uncertainties. I get GPs texting me saying, what would you do with this? Um, you know, I saw, a, I saw a question there about um, regarding anticoagulant. We get a lot of patients on warfarin who are on aspirin, um, you, know, or you know, they say, oh, I'm on Cartier every day. I think you can barely quickly reassure them that that's okay. And you can ask them to hold their shoulder for, you know, two minutes as well, if that's the case. But there's a lot of really simple questions coming up, which you'll be able to answer, I think, fairly easily. Thanks, if I could add to that, I think to remember that many of these patients with complex conditions or, or immunocompromised, we really want them to be vaccinated. Mm. You know, they're going to really struggle if they get COVID. So we, we are not as worried that they're necessarily going to have a side effect. It's more that we just want to time the vaccination for them to be the best time and place, given their medical condition, make sure that, you know, if I mean, if there's someone like we've heard about having cancer chemotherapy, we just, you know, might change, make sure the day of vaccination is the right one for them and their medical condition. But we really want to be encouraging to get vaccinated. There's, you know, I like to say there's, all, there's no medical condition really that you can't be vaccinated for. And if you've got medical conditions, you should be vaccinated. Yeah, I must say we're getting people coming in with renal, you know, renal dialysis, all sorts of fairly um, serious conditions, but they're, they're the people that need to be vaccinated. Um, 
and we're not, you know, they're anecdotally, they're not getting side effects. They're going out and they're really happy about it. So I think, yeah, vaccinate away. Thanks, Penny. Thanks, Christine. Quick question. Is spilling the COVID vaccine in your skin dangerous to the vaccinator? No. <laughs> Thank but, you. But try not to do it. Um, <laughs> so, Sonia, I, um, I, do, I do notice we're at time. Should we, have you got one, one or two last favourites there? I'm sure people probably have got their dinner in the oven. Uh, look, I mean, I think we've covered quite a few of them. There's a lot of questions about immunocompromise, which we've talked about, and I've been scrolling through. A lot of questions are disappearing now because we've answered them. So there was one, one about a couple of questions about vasovagal and should that be reported as an adverse event? Um, a couple of people have asked that question. And in my opinion, I would say, no, we wouldn't report a vasovagal. It's a faint, you know, a lot of people faint for many various reasons. So we would say no. I, I think I agree, and I'm sure Nick would. I think it's just a simple vasovagal where you've anticipated it, you've, you've laid them down, they, they, they feel fine afterwards. But if, you know, if you're uncertain if they've had a head injury and falling down, which I'm sure they won't because you'll be looking after them, um, you know, uh, that would be a different, a different matter or if you've got a concern that it could be, could be others. But um, hopefully they won't actually have the full faint because you'll be, you'll be anticipating that um, and being able to care for them in an anticipatory way. Um, Sonia, I'm just thinking we might, it is 8.02, and um, I think that um, if, if you're comfortable, we might move to wrap up. Sure, no problem. And if there's any burning questions, we can address those afterwards. And I'm not sure how NCRs manage questions after a webinar, but we'll be happy to answer any questions. If there are any really burning questions, we'll do our best to try and help answer them. Yeah, uh, look, I, th I think it... it it is a constantly moving uh, fe feast. I think, um, as Judith said very well, this is not a static situation. No. So, um, you know, please, please do um, continue to access all of the many resources out there. I, I would encourage you, our team have recently, um, in addition to the excellent resources on New South Wales Health and Commonwealth website, we've kind of got a one-stop um, Q&A page, frequently asked questions, and we've also got links to a lot of resources. So. Um, you know, and I, and I think you've hopefully made some connections tonight to some of those resources. So I'll, I'll move to wrap, wrap us up. I'd like to um, particularly, uh, you know, thank J Judith Maxson, the New South Wales uh, Chief Pharmacist, um, Penny Burns and Nick Wood. Um, thank you to all the team involved in tonight. Thank you to Sonia for um, the Q&A. Judith, I feel like I should ask you if there's any final words you'd like to say, but uh, um, if not, I'll, we can say goodnight to everyone. No, I was, my final thoughts are, um, I think it's really positive to that, um, that my pharmacist colleagues have an opportunity to talk to our New South Wales experts about, um, about being part of this um, community of practice. So, um, you know, we've, we very much appreciate pharmacists becoming part of the workforce. A hundred percent. And, uh, and, and let's, let's aim for that as our benchmark for vaccination across Australia. Uh, good night, everyone. And thanks for joining us. Okay. Good night. Thanks. Bye-bye.